Good afternoon, web shadowers. We would like to thank you all for attending our session today. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Alasanya, a first year physical medicine and rehabilitation resident. As always, please remember that the Google form is posted in the comments and on our Instagram bio at the end. With that being said, Dr. Alasanya, you may start when you're ready. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, my name is Dr. Olu Sanya. You can call me Dr. O. And honestly, like you guys, I'm 28 years old. Uh, you guys are probably anywhere from 18 to 22. So I'm only six years older than you guys. So please call me Deji. All right, Deji as in like Reggie, but with a D, okay? Um, today, I am here to talk to you about physical medicine and rehabilitation shadowing session. So basically, what I'm going to do is just talk about what PMNR is. That's what we call it for short. Uh, give you a little background about myself, and then we'll go jump right into a case. So if you guys have any questions, so let me know. Um, I will try to answer all questions as much as possible. I'll try to keep it uh, interactive as much as possible as well. Okay. All right, here we go. So, I uh, get this out, what am I doing here? Okay, here we go. So, uh, like I said, my name is Dr. Olusanya. You can call me Deji. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, my dad was in the army, so we moved around a lot. Uh, I went from Baltimore to Boston to Tampa. I uh, spent about eight years in Boston, moved down to Tampa when I was about nine years old. And then I grew up in Tampa into high school. Then I went to uh, UCF, uh, University of Central Florida. For those who don't know what that is, it's in Orlando near Disney World. I uh, did my four years of undergrad there, go Knights, woo. And um, I majored in biomedical science major. We used to, I, we used to call it um, molecular and microbiology. Um, then after, uh, after undergrad, I then went to Nova Southeastern, Karan Patel College of Medicine, KP Com for medical school. While I was there, I earned my master's of public health and I also received my doctorate of osteopathic medicine. So just finishing up now, and uh, luckily I was able to, you know, with hard work and dedication, I was able to match into my number one choice of residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation here at um, University of Texas uh, Health Science Center, San Antonio. Okay. So, Physical medicine and rehabilitation. I just want to say this right now. <laughs> PMNR is not about, oh, a person is disabled. We have to help them and all that stuff. Some To some people, that does not look great. It doesn't look as lucrative. It doesn't look, you know, it doesn't look uh, so much fun. PMNR is actually a lot of fun. I'll give you the definition. It reads on my slides here. It says, uh, it's a medical specialty that seeks to promote healing and rehabilitation of patients who have suffered injury or disability. Okay, now, if you ask me, it's basically, I would like to say PMNR is basically conservative orthopedics, as in, we do everything an orthopedic uh, surgeon does except the surgery. So orthopedic surgeons will see people in clinics, they'll do a bunch of, um, you know, steroid injections, they'll do anything with pain medicine, they like to look at the anatomy, the nerves and everything. That's everything we focus on, except we just don't do the surgery, okay? Um, what I like about PMNR is PMNR is very, very diverse. You can do a lot of different things. For example, you could do MSK medicine. MSK medicine, where we study a lot of the anatomy, the nerves, the functions, the, the, origination, the origination of the muscle, the insertion of the muscle, what happens when this is lacerated, what happens when this is not functioning well. We look at the whole body as a whole. We also specialize in brain in injury. Um, traumatic or non-traumatic. So meaning as, you know, there's a car accident, someone has a, for God forbid, some type of hemorrhage due to a car accident or non-traumatic, they have an anoxic brain injury, meaning that, you know, they threw, they suffocated on the, while they were vomiting, no oxygen was going to their brain, which they received damage to their brain. Or stroke patients, you know, uh, these patients, they have some deficits, they have, you know, um, neural deficits where they're not able to talk, they're not able to walk, anymore like they used to, and our job is to rehab them back to baseline. We get them, we, we just basically improve their function as much as possible. We also deal with spinal cord injury patients, so paraplegias, 
uh, people who have these spinal cord injuries who you know can't walk anymore. We try to rehab them. We try to manage their medications as much as possible. What I love about PMNR is that we have great fellowship as well. We deal in a lot of specialties we can go into. You go into sports medicine, so you see ringside physicians. You know, especially during MMA, football, basketball team physicians are are mostly PMNR or orthopedic uh, physicians. We have fellowships in MSK or interventional spine medicine. We can do headache medicine, so people who suffer from migraines. If you're into um, uh, if you're into like plastics a little bit, we, we do a lot of Botox injections. So we do cosmetics as, and, as well as uh, medical interventions. And then we also do pain management. Pain management is one of the things I want to specialize in and uh, it's a great field to go into. So just to sum it up, PM&R is a great field to go into. We're basically trying to promote healing and restore function to the human body. And we focus mainly on anatomy and, neuro, and neuroanatomy as well. So anatomy and physiology, what we'll be talking about today is the shoulder. Uh, well, first, to, I'll first give you a little bit of description of the muscles, the nerves, and the bones of the shoulder, and then I'll show you some pictures, okay? So muscles of the shoulder, major muscles of the shoulder. First, uh, the most important to me is the deltoid, okay? You know, all my guys in the group chat right now, you know, like to go to the gym and work on your deltoids. Uh, this muscle is very important. Um, now, I have a number next to it, mean 30 to 90, meaning that the main function of the deltoids is to help with uh, AB, abduction away from the body, from 30 degrees to 90 degrees. So if you're standing up, you know, you put your hands from the side of your thighs to 30 degrees and from 30 degrees straight out to 90 degrees, that's what's helping pull away your arms away from your body, the deltoid muscle, okay? Trapezius helps with uh, suppression and elevation of your shoulders. That also helps with uh, abduction, abduction away from the body, 90 degrees and above. So 90 to 180. And then you have your bicep tendons as well. Bicep tendons are not really part of the shoulder function wise, but they do have an importance of anatomy that the bicep tendon is right in the interior part of the shoulder, which is very important, which you'll see later with differential diagnosis, okay? Most importantly, I want you guys to focus on is the rotator cuff muscles. So focus on the acronym SITS, okay? The S stands for supraspinatus. That helps with abduction uh, away from the body and stabilization of the shoulder. That also helps with abduction from zero to 30 degrees. Uh, you have the infraspinatus, which muscle which helps with external rotation, the teres minor muscle, which helps with external rotation and abduction and the subscapularis muscle, which helps with internal rotation and abduction, okay? So I want you guys to remember those four muscles and, the, and try to remember the functions, okay? Because it may come up later. So here we go, all right. So here we have the supraspinatus muscle sits on top of the right parallel to the scapula, okay? It sits right on top. Below you have the infraspinatus muscle. Here's the teres minus muscle. Here's the teres major muscle, really not important uh, for clinical wise. Here's your triceps muscle. Over here, you have your, um, in the front, you have the bicep muscles. And over here, you're gonna have the short and long head. The short head connects to your pector pectoralis major and the long head is gonna go into the incipital groove of the humerus, okay? And then over here, over that bicep tendon is the deltoid muscle, okay? I want you guys to look at these uh, muscles and try to imagine them as we go through the case. So, all right, so let us proceed. Case study, 49 year old retired male who sales competitively presented with the intermittent right shoulder pain. The reported onset followed by a day of sailing. Pain was initially sharp on abduction and flexion of the right shoulder and changed to a dull pain which lasted for several hours. It was aggravated by lying on the shoulder, reaching and lifting with the right arm. Pain was relieved by Tylenol and icing. The athlete reported that three years earlier, he had injured the same shoulder while sailing. He was pain-free and had full range of motion by the end of the four weeks. Two years later, he had a second, second similar injury, okay? So what are the appropriate questions to ask? Can anyone tell me?
Anyone know any questions they can ask? I'm all ears. No? Okay. Oh, let's see what we got. Let's in the chat. Okay. Zoom the latest chat for about 45 seconds. Okay, so we'll wait. What makes it better or worse? Yes. Past medical history. Oh, you guys are smart. Okay. All right, but we're not there yet. When did the pain start? Pain scale. Okay, you guys are prepped. Okay, you guys are good. Okay. Pain scale. When did the pain start? What are the previous injuries? What were the previous injuries? Okay. How long does the pain persist? Okay. Family history. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we have any other answers. What activities make it? Yes. What sensation of pain is it? Yes. You guys, I love it. You guys are thinking like doctors. You guys are going in and this is awesome. Continuous pain or intermittent. Okay. Awesome. You guys are well along because honestly, I did not know these answers until I got to med school. And the fact that you guys are saying this type of stuff before you guys get into medical school is a, is a, it's, it's really impressive. I'm very impressed. Has the shoulder been injured before? Full list of any past medications. Okay. Awesome. So what I want to, when you guys get to medical school, right, they're going to, they're going to teach you how to do an HPI, a his, uh, history of present illness. Okay. And there's a couple things you need to ask. Okay. The first thing you want to ask is onset when, where, and how in the chronicity. Okay. So this is very important. When did the pain start? Where does it start? When you guys, uh, when you guys are residents, you guys are going to be reporting to uh, attendings and they want to know where that pain is specifically. For example, if I have knee pain, is it above the joint line? Is it medial to the kneecap? Is it lateral to the knee kneecap? You know, is it at the joint line? All these specific places, you have to pay attention to detail. It's very specific. So you want to know where, you want to know how, what was the patient doing? Um, as you know, in our patient, he was basically competitively sailing. It happened over a long period of time, which leads into our next point, chronicity. That's very important. Is it acute or is it a chronic situation? Next up, we want to know the location of pain. Like I said, that's very, very, very important. Like I said before, uh, you want to be very specific anatomically wise of where the pain is, okay? Then you want to know the description of pain. Is it sharp, dull, or does it have any radiation? Does any, can anyone tell me the difference of why you would want to know if the pain is sharp or dull? Can anyone answer that question for me? Mm -mm. Location. Yep. So the reason why you would ask, is it sharp or dull, is because um, you want to know if sharp, sharp usually equates to acute pain, you know, and then dull will equate to chronic pain. Um, if you guys ever go into um, osteopathic medicine or if you guys go to a DO school, you guys will learn a lot about um, osteopathic manipulative medicine. And they try to tell you the characteristics of sharp and dull and what it means. Radiation is old cards, yeah. That's someone there's this in a great place. Uh, radiation is important because if the pain, you know, if, for example, someone comes in with sciatic pain, which means that a nerve is being compressed between the piriformis muscle of your, basically in your butt, you're having pinpoint pain in your butt and is it, is it radiating past the knee or is it, radi is it not radiating past the knee? That will tell you the difference between uh, basically a bulging disc and radiculopathy. So it's very important to know radiation of pain. Next up, we wanna know pain scale, one through 10. Very subjective, but you're able to see, okay, is this person, is she in, in, is she in distress? Is she in non-distress? What's your pain scale, you know? What are the alleviating and exacerbating factors? Does it is it better with rest? Is it is it worse with movement? You know, there. For example, with shoulder pain, we all know that if if pain, if moving your arm above your head, you know, trying to reach for objects above your head, 
that's one of the indications of rotator cuff tears, okay? Or trying to reach for things behind your back. So it's very, very important what type of movements they're doing. And does that type of movement, is it worse or is it better? And associated symptoms. Is there any weakness? Is there any numbness or tingling? Is the area of pain, is it hot? Is it cold or any type of erythema? Uh, you wanna know these, these uh, questions and they're very important. So subjective, as we said before, this is very important. Anytime you wanna report to attending, you have to answer these questions. So things you wanna know. Past medical history, what diseases did it have? You know, um, it's so funny because you guys will see this when you, when you guys talk to these patients, you're like, you have any past medical history, like anything like hypertension or diabetes? They no, 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 I don't. And then you ask them type of medications. Oh yeah, I have, you know, I take uh, metformin, <laughs> I take lisinopril. I said, oh, sir, I thought you said you had no past medical history. They, people just, you, once you say past medical diseases, they say, oh, I don't have a disease. So it's very important to ask both because when you ask past medical history or if you ask if they have any diseases, they'll say no. Then you ask them medications and they're taking all these medications and you know what diseases they have, okay? You also wanna know past surgeries. It's very important, especially in the MSK world, PM&R world, to know a lot about past surgeries. Do they have a rotator cuff repair? Do they have a, a bicep tendon repair? You know, Do they have a fracture repair? It's very important to know these things because these two can be causing the chronic pain that they're having. Family history. Family history is very important as if you wanna know any type of uh, rheumatologic diseases. So if they have rheumatoid arthritis in the family, if they have lupus, maybe they're more prone to osteoporosis. Do uh, you wanna know those type of things for family history? Social history is very important, you know, especially when we're considering taking a patient into, like, do I have to refer them to surgery? You know, are, are they smoking a lot? Because if they're smoking a lot, I don't know if the orthopedic surgeon wants to operate on them, you know, are they drinking? Also, you wanna know if they're smoking because, you know, smoking can interfere with bone healing, you know? Is that one of the factors that is not letting them heal well? You wanna know allergies. And allergies is just important to avoid a lawsuit. Uh, if you're going and you're trying to treat a patient with a steroid injection or you're giving them any type of medication and you don't know their allergies, they're allergic to ibuprofen, they're allergic to insects, they're allergic to steroids. It's very important to know these things before you know how you wanna treat the patient. Any questions so far before I move on? There you go. Switch. Okay, no questions so far. Good. Also, you want to look at the review of systems. Review of systems is basically a system we use in the medical world to see if anything else is going on with them. So you ask something about, you know, their eyes, any change in visions, ask them about out, um, if they have any like discharge from their nose, if they have any headache, chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, cough, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. You're trying to ask as much as review systems to basically help you with your differential diagnosis, okay? I think I have a question actually, let's see. Uh, how long does it take you to become confident in remembering these type of stuff? So I'll be honest with you guys. It's so, it's very, you're never going to just learn something and you're never going to just, oh, I learned it and now I remember it. It's all good. Like it, it doesn't work like that. The things you guys are learning now, especially for MCAT and stuff like that, you're going to forget it. You know, the only time it, it, it comes with the years. So it could take even after medical school, four years of doing it. It still took, I, I got into uh, residency and some of the things I didn't remember. It took me a couple of weeks and months to remember them because I've learned them before, but it all comes back to you. So it takes years of learning. And the thing is being a doctor, it never stops. You know, you're going to continue to learn every year. You take your board exams every 10 years, even when you're done with uh, medical school. So you're always learning things. You're always gonna be learning. You're gonna always forget things, but you're always gonna learn things. And honestly, you learn most from your patients. Once you see a patient and you see the same thing over and over again, you're gonna, like, okay, I remember this. Oh, I remember this. Every patient is different, you know, but you're, for the most part, you remember. It'll take years, but you'll remember everything. How important would you say pharmacology is in PM&R? Oh, it's very important. 
is very important. Pharmacology, we deal with a lot of drugs and physiology where we're trying to balance the parasympathetic nerves of your bladder. So for example, if a patient has a spinal cord injury and that now, you know, you know the spinal cord, it has to do a lot with bladder control and your um, defecation. Now, you know, you don't have that control because you lost it. Now we have to use certain medications like laxatives to help you poop or to help you go to the or urinate to control your bladder. Pharmacology is very important, especially in pain medication. You know, if you're, if, you know, you do your four years of residency and you do a fellowship in pain, you're dealing with all drugs, opioids. You know, you have to know the mechanism of actions. You have to know the class of um, these drugs. Pharmacology is very, very big in PMNR because it's just, PMNR is such a wide field. We have to know our medication and we have to know, because we're treating these patients and we have to know how these drugs are affecting our patients. What's the difference between physical therapy and PMNR? Okay, so that's a good question. Physical therapy strictly work, just focuses on physical therapy, which is they you come in with a patient, you have a certain deficit like range of motion, range of motion or muscle strengthening, uh, and then that's what physical therapists kind of just you know focuses on. PMNR we do everything else. We 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 only we focus on physical therapy, but we also focus on their occupational therapy. We prescribe you no know, drugs. You know, we make we come up with diagnoses. We work with physical therapists. So if a patient comes to us and something is going on with them, you know, and we say, okay, this is happening. They need this, this, and that. We will tell the physical therapist, look. During therapy, I want you to work with this and work with that. And then the physical therapist will talk to us and tell us, okay, this is what's happening with them. They're improving in this type of strength. They're improving with this range of motion. And then we'll reassess the patient and see what we can do further to help them in that specific treatment, okay? So physical therapy and PMNR, I won't lie to you, they're very similar, but we have different roles, you know? Us being the doctors, we're able to prescribe medication and come with, up with diagnosis and come up with treatment plans. With physical therapy, we just kind of work with them about the treatment plan and they come up with the specific exercises they need to do in order to help you improve in that function, okay? I hope that answers the question. It's a complicated question a little bit. <laughs> All right, so moving on. So objective examination. So there's four things you need to do when you're looking at the shoulder or any type of MSK uh, muscle skeletal system. You need to work, look at inspection, range of motion, sensation, and muscle strain. Inspection is basically, okay, I'm looking at the joint, what looks abnormal, what looks normal. That's why it's always important to compare the both joints, your left and your right, you know? Inspection, you're looking, you're trying to identify any abnormality in the muscle, the muscle bulk or any asymmetrical bony deficit. So you're looking for any rashes, you're looking for any change in skin color. Is it warm? Is it hot? You're feeling it, you know? Is the muscle bulging? Is it not bulging? Is it twitching? Is it is the bone dislocated? You're looking at just, you're just looking and you're observant. You have to be very observant when you're looking at the expect, um, inspection. Next thing up we wanna do is range of motion. Can anyone tell me the difference between active and passive range of motion? Anybody. Okay, so I don't think okay, active means what you that you're exerting force. So in a way, yes, you're kind of right. So basically active, the difference between active and passive range of motion is active is meaning that you're, the patient is making the movement. They're the ones moving their joints. Passive range of motion is the doctor holds the patient's arm or joint or leg and they're moving the patient. They're trying to see if they can increase that range of motion without them because patients sometimes will move and they can't move, for example, if I have my arm at 90 degrees, or if a patient has their arm at 90 degrees, they can't move it past 90 degrees because they're in pain, okay? So their active range of motion is 90 degrees, and the pain is inhibiting them from moving further. But with passive range of motion, when a doctor now moves that shoulder, even though they're still having pain past 90 degrees, that means that their range of motion is better with help, okay? And that kind of serves as, okay, their shoulder isn't as bad as we thought, okay? 
And now different movement has different range of motion. What I mean by that, it's that now with my shoulders, I have range of motion from zero to 180 degrees. Zero degrees being right at my thighs, 180 degrees meaning I'm raising my arm from my thighs all the way to my head. But for your knees or not even knees, let's talk about your hip. Hip extension and hip, fle uh, hip extension and hip flexion can be 90 degrees, but hip external rotation and internal rotation will be 45 degrees. So you just have to know the specific range of motion of what you're, you're testing. Sensation, you're just looking at if everything's intact. We're looking at light touch, sharp versus dull. I like to play a little joke on my patients. I'll tell them to close their eyes and I'll get like a, a pen and I'll stab them with the sharp side. I say, is it sharp or dull? And they'll tell me sharp or dull, you know? So you just want to see if they're, you know, feeling the sensation that is appropriate to what you're giving, the stimulus, okay? And then also muscle strength, which I think is very important. Muscle strength can tell you the difference between rotator cuff injury or are they having some type of tendonitis, you know? Uh, and then you have the scale. So if uh, it's usually five out of five, if it's a zero, it means they have no muscle activation. One means that they have a little bit of activation. It's like a twitch and they, they cannot uh, achieve full range of motion. Two is meaning that they have muscle activation with gravity eliminated, el eliminated. So that means if I raise someone's arm or let's say someone's arm is at rest and they can't lift their arm at all. But once I raise their arm, so like 90 degrees and they're able to lift it up, that means with help, they're able to lift it up. So that would, that's what that means. And that they're also achieving full range of motion. Uh, three means that they have muscle activation against gravity and full range of motion. Four means that they uh, have muscle activation against some resistance. So that means I'm resisting the person's movement and they're able to resist me somewhat and they have full range of motion as well. And five out of five means that they're basically resisting when I'm pushing on them full force, they're able to resist me and they have full range of motion as well. Okay, so those are the four things we look at in objective examination, but then we also want to look at special exams. Okay, now special, ex there's different special exams for different parts of the shoulder. We can't run through all of them right now because it's just way too much, but there's three, three important special exams I want to show you. Okay. So first is the empty can test, okay? On this patient, we are trying to observe uh, their rotator cuff uh, muscles, specifically the supraspinatus muscle, okay? I'm gonna click on this link, see if it brings me to it. We'll try to go from there. We'll try to watch this. If it loads up, there we go. Just a minute. It's only 23 seconds, so it's very... We go. In this test, the examiner resists abduction with the arm of the patient elevated to 90 degrees and internally rotated. If the patient gives way, the test is considered positive. Okay, so that's the empty can test. Okay, so let's move back to our presentation. Uh, how do I get back? Let's see. There we go. Awesome. Okay. And then we have the Hawkins test. Hawkins test, uh, it tests for basically subacromial impingement syndrome. Let's see if we go here. test is performed by forward flexing the patient's arm to 90 degrees, bending the elbow, and forcibly internally rotating the humerus. This drives the greater tuberosity under the coracoacromial arch, impinging the supraspinatus tendon. Okay, and then last but not least, we have, let me see if I can move this real. We have the Jurgensen apprehension test. And this test basically tests for bicep tendon uh, tears or tendonitis. Jurgensen's. In this video, I'm going to show you how to perform the Jurgensen 8, show the sensitivity applied against the body. Then ask your patient to perform 
supination and resist the movement. At the same time, make sure that you palpate the biceps tap. In the bicep, the little groove. If you feel the biceps tendon popping out of the groove, this indicates a tear of the transverse humeral ligament. Tenderness or pain without the pop is indicative for biceps tendinosis or slap lesions. Okay. So those are the important tests we want to basically try. Let's see if I can get back to this. Okay. Let's go back. I go full screen here. Bear with me, guys, for one second. There we go. So, all right. So, imaging. What do you guys think? What do you? What kind of imaging do we want to? What kind of uh, imaging exams do we want to get here? Let's see what people have to say. Anyone with a guess? MRI, it's a little aggressive, but it's nice. <laughs> Ultrasound, x-ray, that's a good one. Many say, many are saying MRI, CT, okay. Okay. So you guys are right, yes, MRI, but I want you guys to think stepwise. And I say it's aggressive is because usually MRI is not the first thing you wanna to shoot to in this position, okay? Because when you're, you have to understand there's a difference between medical knowledge when it comes to books and medical knowledge when it comes to um, clinical medicine, okay? Now, when it comes to the, in the clinic, the first thing you always wanna do is get x-rays. All right, you want to see the anatomy, you want to see the bone. So that's the first thing you do, okay? So you'll get x-rays bilateral. Bilateral, you want to compare the left and right shoulder. You want to see it in the three views. So anterior, posterior, and laterally, okay? Very important, you want to see those x-rays. Then yes, you would get an MRI, but you would have to give, you would have to basically tell the patient, okay, here's the x-rays. Let's try conservative management, do what you need to do. Okay, come back in six months then we get the MRIs, okay? I'm learning there's a huge difference. You can't just get an MRI, MRI for everything. And it's not your guys' fault. That's the way they train us, you know? What's the answer? Let's just do it that way. But you have to like, it's a, it's a stepwise process, okay? But you're right, we would get an MRI. MRI would definitely tell us what's going on with the shoulders, specifically with the tissues. And because you guys say MRI is making me further think that you guys know what's going on with the patient, okay? You get an EMG. Can anyone tell me what an EMG is? Don't look it up either. Electrical activities and muscle, yes, 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 electromyograph. So electromyography is basically a test where we like to, like to see the electricity in the muscles. And that's one of the great things about PMNR. I think PMNR and a uh, neurologist perform these exams. It's an outpatient exam. It's a great way to have in your outpatient practice, a great way to make money. And we basically see the nerve conductions. Is it slow? Is it appropriate? Is it too fast? We get to diagnose a lot of different um, diseases like carpal tunnel syndrome and tendinopathies. Um, they're very, it's just very important in a, a musculoskeletal medicine, okay? CT scan. CT scan, you wouldn't really use this in the situation. You can get it, you can confirm your diagnosis with it, but it's not really important. What we would really do in the clinic is go to x-rays and MRIs, okay? CBC, a complete blood count. It's not really an imaging, but it's kind of the blood work you would do. Um, and the, why, uh, why would a CBC be important in this case? Can anyone tell me? Or why would you get any type of blood work? 
for example, CBC, CMP, urine, urine analysis. Oops. Can, can anyone tell me why we would get any type of blood work? Throughout other causes, what other causes? Internal bleeding, no, not so much, Aaron. Calcium levels, yes. Why calcium levels? Don't tell me the answer, tell me why. Potential infection, yes, that's good, I like that. Inflammation, yes, that is awesome. You guys are doing great. Yes, awesome. So basically, someone said it, to rule out other causes, but what other causes? Basically, to rule out differential diagnosis. Because, okay, a person comes with shoulder pain, all right, that doesn't tell me anything. But, okay, they, could they have infection? Could they, can they have any type of inflammatory diseases, such like rheumatoid arthritis? You know, that can affect the shoulder. Uh, gout, that could, not most likely, but gout can affect the shoulder, you know? Can they have lupus? All they have these um, inflammatory markers depositing into the bone of the arm that can cause... Um, uh, a shoulder pain, you know? Or what about white blood cell count increase? Yes, infection, they can have erysipelas. They can have any type of, you know, cellulitis, depending on what the skin look, looks like. So that's very, very important. And you guys are thinking like doctors. This is awesome. I'm very, very, very impressed with you guys. So differential diagnosis. Anyone give me any type of differential diagnosis? Be, be specific. Don't tell me infection. Give me a, give me a, a specific disease. Osteoporosis, I like that, yes. That's a good one. Arthritis, yes. What type of arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis. Yes, RCS. Anybody else? Huntington's, no. <laughs> Not Huntington's, that's way off. <laughs> Not Huntington's. Osteoarthritis connected, yes, ankylosing spondylitis. I wouldn't do ankylosing spondylitis. That's usually with um, back pain. Uh, not really anything about the shoulder, okay? Yes, tearing, fraying tendons of rotator cuff. Yes, could be lupus, yes. Think, I want you guys to think more tendonitis, yes. Think more MSK medicine. Polymagic rheumatica, yes, that's right. That could be one. Think more MSK. Sciatica, no, not sciatica. The patient's not complaining of numbness and tingling of the of the of the lower extremity, autoimmune. Shoulder not good, itis. <laughs> That's funny. All right, I'll stop torturing you guys. And you guys will get better with this as you practice more in clinic, okay? So they can have some type of AC joint injury. Uh, and when I say injury, they can basically have an AC joint separation. They can have, depending on the age, are they young, are they old? If they're old, they're more likely to have AC joint arthritis. If they're young, they can have AC joint ten tendonitis or some type of injury that can occur, okay? Brachial plexus injury happens when people drop from nowhere and drop right on their shoulder. And you know the brachial plexus. I, I remember the brachial plexus, especially at UCF. I think his name was Dr. Sam Sam. I don't know if he still works there, but boy, that class was tough. And he made us draw the brachial plexus in and out. And if you like did not have the right nerve in the right location, automatic, automatically fail. He doesn't anymore. Oh, he doesn't work there anymore? Yeah, Dr. Sam Sam was awesome. His wife worked there too. I forgot her name. She did physiology. She was good too. Dr. Dow is teaching it now. Okay. Yep. Don't know who that is. But Dr. Samson, is, I, I, like I said, people were afraid of that class. 
but he used to make us draw the brachial plexus all the time. He he recently left to the PT school. Oh, that's awesome. Good for him. Good for him. Someone said chronic injury. Okay, yes, good. Chronic injury of the rotator cuff. That's good. Awesome. Okay. So, oops, what just happened? No, 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 no. Let's get out of here. Okay, here we go. Let's make this big. Here we go. All right, let's see. What else? What else are we looking at? Cervical disc injuries. Okay. Cervical disc injuries, uh, and I think also meaning that something with your uh, cervical vertebrae, there's seven cervical vertebrae. You can have some type of accident. You know, you can have some type of cervical disc arthritis, radiculopathy, where the bones change. They have degenerate changes in the bones. Now it's compressing on your um, median nerve or your ulnar nerve, where now it's causing numbness and tingling in your fingers, you know, or it can radiate to your shoulder. Rotator cuff tears. I believe someone said something about rotator cuff tears, okay? Oh, here we go. What are the muscles of the rotator cuff? I wish you guys were on audio because I don't want you – if you guys type it, I feel like you looked it up. What are the what are the rotator cuff muscles? Go ahead. I want to put someone on the spot. And what are the functions? If anyone gets this right, you have got – a lot of brownie points with me. Or if most people get it right, I'm very happy. What are the rotator cuff muscles and what are the functions? Supraspinatus, okay. They're saying sits. Okay, great. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. What are the functions? Anyone know the functions? Shoulder abduction, yes. Now it's very specific to be very specific with with which muscle. Supraspinatus, abduction and stabilization. Supraspinatus, we're doing zero to thirty degrees abduction. Okay. Then you have the infraspinatus. Okay, external rotation and abduction. Teres minor, as well as external rotation and abduction, and then subscapularis, internal rotation, abduction. Okay, horizontal abduction. Yes, retraction. Yes, that's also part of it. Good job, guys. I'm very proud of you. Good, good job. Okay. Cervical radiculopathy. That's what I talked about when there's certain bone chain, bony changes in the cervical disc or the cervical vertebrae, and they now compress on the nerves, causing numbness and tingling of the median or ulnar nerve or pain radiating to the shoulder as well. Bicep tendon tear. I was actually surprised no one said that in the differential diagnosis. So remember I told you biceps is not really part of the shoulder, but the, the tendon, it's right on the anterior part of the shoulder. So when you do the Jurgensen test, you know, when you lift up and it's positive, that's telling you, okay, maybe it's not AC joint. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the bicep tendon uh, uh, tendonitis or it's a tear, okay? Clavicle fractures, you know, we deal with that all the time. You know, some of them, they're operated. Some of them are not operated. But with this guy, he's had a chronic issues with the shoulders. I highly doubt it's clavicle fractures, okay? Contusion or bruising. Like I said, this seems to be a little bit more chronic. Contusion and bruising wouldn't put it there, but it's definitely a differential diagnosis, okay? Any questions so far? We're pulling to the end, guys. You guys are doing great. Okay, I am assuming there are not further questions and we will save the questions for the end. Okay, so let me get out of here. Okay, guys, so what does he have? Can anyone tell me what does this man have? I think we had a questions. What is the final answer?
Can anyone tell me? Anyone tell me what he has? Rotator cuff syndrome. Rotator cuff syndrome. Rotator cuff tear. Okay. Rotator cuff tear. Okay. Anything else? Bicep tendon tear. Okay. Bicep tendon tear. Okay. Degenerative arthritis of the AC joint. That's good. Good answer. Good try. Labral tear. That's a very good one. Okay. Okay. AC joint separation. All good answers. And to be fair, I didn't give you guys a whole exam, but this patient that you guys remember the case study, physical exam, intact sensation, muscle strength, uh, with abduction and flexion, two out of five, okay? Uh, also, positive empty can test, but positive as well as cross arm body test. And I want to go into that. The reason why is because the pain, you're going to always have pain in the shoulder. These specialization tests are not very specific, they're just very sensitive, okay? What gives it away is that he has weakness on the empty can test. When a patient has pain and weakness, it's definitely pointing to a rotator cuff tear, okay? What else? And that's trying to get you guys ready clinically wise. Because yes, x-rays can tell you many things and MRIs can tell you any, everything. But those are just to confirm your diagnosis. You have to start thinking like a clinician. You have to start thinking, okay, what's going on with my patient? You don't want to depend on the MRI or depend on the x-ray to tell you what's going on, okay? And that's the purpose of this, of this shadowing session, to make you guys start to think like doctors. What's going on clinically with my patient? What symptoms are they having? What, what is positive and what is negative, okay? And yes, rotator cuff tear, specifically supraspinatus muscle, we would say a full thickness tear in our EMR notes, okay? So that's what he has. Approach the patient. So with the supraspinatus muscle rotator cuff tear, it depends on the age of the patient, how you approach them. If it's an athlete and he's probably more serious and he's gonna lose more time or she, sorry, you, I would basically try to approach them with compassion, not try to make too many jokes, okay? But one of the things people love about physicians is that they can make they can make negative situations into positive situations. So I'll start off with a joke, maybe good news, bad news, something like that. And I'll just ease into them and tell them, okay, what do you think? What do you think is going on with your muscle? And uh, or what's going on with or your shoulder? And then, you know, I'll tell them what I'm thinking. I'll tell them what the MRI says. I'll tell them what the x-ray says. And then I'll come up with a plan. But it's very, very important to involve the patient in the plan. It's very important to make them feel like, you know, not to also make them feel, just to make them part of the plan. So you say, you have a rotator cuff muscle tear. We could do this, this, and that. Okay, what, do you, what would you like to do? It's very important to let the patient feel like they are part of the plan and they want to, they actually have a say, you know? And with that, you'll win them over. They'll trust you more. And that's what's important, is having their trust. And also you learn in med school, it's not all about your decision, you know? You can give your recommendation, but at the end of the day, the patient is hiring you, you know? So you just have to give them your recommendation and go from there, all right? So with this approach, I would specifically say, sir, ma'am, um, what this is what's going on. This is what I find in my clinical findings. Um, this is what the MRI says, and you have a tear in your shoulder, okay? And this is what we can do. And you offer the options, they choose what they want to go from, and then we'll go from there, okay? So treatment. It all depends on the severity of the, uh, the injury. It also depends on um, the age of the patient, as I said before. So first up is always conservative treatment, and that's usually with rotator cuff strains, okay? We'll use NSAIDs like Tylenol. Um, not, sorry, not NSAIDs as an ibuprofen, Aleve. Uh, ibuprofen is also called Motrin, Naproxen. Um, you can also uh, use Tylenol, which is not an NSAID, it's acetaminophen. Um, and you can use those type of treatments for this type of pain. You can also use heat and ice, all right? That's very important. 
Uh, people forget about heat. Uh, they always think, oh, I just need to put ice down. But you have to understand heat actually allows um, vasodilation of the blood vessels that brings more blood and more oxygen to those muscles. When you bring in more oxygen, you're creating more current in the electron transport chain, creating more energy and more healing in the muscles, okay? Also, physical therapy, PT, very, very important. People don't understand that physical therapy can really help you when you're having some type of shoulder strain, especially of the rotator cuff muscle. This will help you get back your range of motion and your muscle strengthening. It's also important that these patients continue their home exercises as well. Oh, exactly. To my next point, home exercises. People think, oh, I just do PT. That's it. No, you have to do PT. You also have to do home exercises to help strengthen those muscles. Then my personal favorite, corticosteroid injections. You can do that for a partial tear or strain or complete tears. It's, up to, it's really up to the physician himself, the attending, or your discretion. What do you want to do? Steroid injections, you have to be careful because you have to watch out for patients who have diabetes, you also have to understand that steroid injections are more like bandages. They don't completely heal everything um, and they don't last a long time. It depends on the patient. Sometimes steroid injections last for months to years, sometimes to, week, to days to weeks. So it really depends, but it's very fun. I think I have a YouTube video showing what a steroid injection looks like, actually. Let me see if I can pull it up. It's about a Uh, let's see. There we go. To do a subacromial bursa injection for a shoulder impingement syndrome, you're going to start by palpating the posterior lateral aspect of the acromion and the humeral head, and you're aiming for the, uh -oh. for the depression between these. Mark your spot and prep the skin. Now you can choose your shoulder cocktail. You can mix either lidocaine or bupivacaine with some steroid, like methylprednisolone. You can repalpate your landmarks and then inject a wheel, or in this case, we're just gonna go, go straight in one poke with the needle. Aim for the spot you marked, and you can angle that needle about 10 degrees upwards from horizontal. Aspirate some fluid if you can, and then inject the medication. If you suspect rupture of a calcific tendonitis, Remember to use a larger gauge needle like an 18. That way you can try to aspirate out some of that crunchy calcium deposit first. For this patient, his range of motion improved almost immediately. Now, remember, this technique looks very similar to an arthrocentesis of the shoulder or an intraarticular shoulder injection. So be sure to check out that video as well and make sure you found the one that suits your needs. I'm Dr. Jess Mason. And that is a subacromial bursa injection. So yeah, injections, very awesome. Very great way of, uh, hold on, let me see, I'm trying to make this thing, there we go. Very great way or treat, great, great treatment of trying to treat these shoulder um, pathologies. My name is Scott Goodman, I'm an orthopedic surgeon here on Oops. the south side. And this video- That's enough for you guys. All right. Also, she noticed she said uh, subacromial pinching syndrome. I'll let you guys know right now, especially I'm in orthopedics right now. We do the same approach for most, basically most of uh, injections of the shoulder that comes with pathology, unless we're dealing with bicep tendon tears and we're dealing with AC joint injuries. But if it's rotator cuff injury or subacromial bursitis, we'll usually do the subacromial approach, okay? That's kind of a end all treat all approach. And then last but not least, we refer to orthopedics for surgery. For this patient, this is exactly what we would do. This patient, how we would treat this patient is basically he comes in with a tear. We'd probably offer corticosteroid injection just to help for pain, depending on when he's going to get the surgery. If he's gonna get it immediately, we just get him right to the surgery. If he's gonna get it months from now, we'll basically give him a steroid injection so we can hold him over. And then we'll refer him to orthopedics for the surgery. Then we'll probably, PM&R, we'll specifically see him after the surgery to basically get him through the rehab and see how he's progressing through in, uh, in our outpatient clinic, okay? And moving on. And those are my references. That's the end of my uh, presentation. Any questions so far, guys? Anything you guys would like to add? Anything you would like to critique? 
I am all open. We got three. Let's see. How do you know the injection is exactly 10 degrees? Okay. <laughs> so you don't know exactly 10 degrees, but it's it's a fine movement and it comes with practice. So you'll inject it and you'll just you'll literally just have a little bit of a motion of depression down. And you'll kind of, if you feel the needle go and you feel like it's hitting bone above it, then you're way too far. You just go a little bit, you know, and then inject. It's, it doesn't have to be exactly 10 degrees. You don't really need to be exactly 10 degrees. Not everything is by book, guys. You just go in, elevate it slightly, and just inject. It doesn't have to be exactly 10 degrees. Someone asks, why does it matter if a patient has diabetes or hypertension for cortical injections? Okay, so it matters because steroids, uh, they're known to increase your blood sugars. So with someone not, you know, someone not controlling their sugars, and you give them steroid injections, and it's a possibility of increasing their blood sugars, you're basically, you're adding, you're harming the patient. More blood sugar, more diabetes, more, you know, di diabetic neuropathy, it's just not good. Diabetes is probably one of the worst diseases you can have, guys. Um, let's see. Why did you choose DO? So I didn't choose DO. <laughs> she, DO chose me. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be cocky when I say that. I literally mean uh, DO school. Well, I didn't care what school I went into. I, when I graduated UCF, I didn't have a great MCAT guys. Not going to lie. I didn't get in the first time. So I had to do a, a master's degree to get in. And one of the programs that offered it to me was a DO school that I have. We're actually a DO and an MD school. I just got into the DO program. And at the end of the day, I'm happy I got into DO program because it helped me choose physical medicine and rehabilitation. I know it's the whole thing, especially with Twitter and the whole where's figs uh, situation with the MD versus DO and the Trump situation is that. But guys, that like, honestly, when I was in college, yeah, that was the saying. I had all my people, my fraternity and everything, some don't do DO. But I'm a DO in the MD pro in the MD residency. You know, uh, I had to take step one. You know, I had to take USM at least one and two. That sucked. On top of taking my DO board exams, but because of I scored well and I proved myself, I was I got an MD residency. So, but it's all it doesn't even I don't even like saying MD residency because it's all one now. It's all DOs and MDs are recognized by the same AC and GME program. So it really doesn't matter. Okay. Why did the physician massage the shoulder before inserting the needle? So um, it, it's not really specific. He, he wasn't massaging, he was palpating. And what palpating, he was trying to basically see where the joint he wants to inject, you know? So basically with the needle, there's like an imprint on the cover of the needle and you're massaging, you're trying to feel where the patient is tender. Usually where, where they're tender exactly is basically where they're having pain and that's where you want to inject the needle. Why did the physician massage? Okay, we said that twice. Do you use ultrasound when using? Yeah, you can. Uh, you don't have to, but if you want to get a more accurate, uh, you want to get a more accurate injection, you can use uh, ultrasound. One of the cool things about PMNR is that that's exactly what we do. We do a lot of ultrasound injections. Okay. I'm curious if in <laughs> if an injection is painful. Yes and no. It depends. We use a. Uh, we use a, a cold spray to kind of numb the areas like lidocaine where we'll numb the area and the insertion of the needle doesn't really hurt. But when a person is trying to angle that needle into the subjoint, depending on what joint it is, usually knees are painful. And it's either with obese patients that I'm like today, I had an obese patient and he I had to do a bilateral knee injection. And on obese patients, it's so hard to do a knee injection. So I'm just in there trying to get in the joint and he's, he's like, you know, he's moving, he's in pain, but I got it, you know? So it depends. Like initially injecting the needle, not very painful. When you're starting to move the needle around to try to get into that joint a little bit, 10 degrees there, 10 degrees there, it can get a little painful. How is your experience doing an MPH and DO simultaneously? So again, another side story to that. I started my MPH before I did my DO. I had a two year layoff between college and medical school. And I was supposed to get in, I thought I did that master's program. I got in, but then I got deferred because of immunization shots. It was really ridiculous actually. So while my another year off, I decided what I'm gonna do, am I gonna sit around and do nothing or am I gonna do more education? 
decided to get a master's of public health, which is great because I have my own nonprofit organization, which I'll tell you guys about that in a little bit. How has Corona affected your job? Corona has it's affected my job, not as in like, you know, I don't work more, I don't work less. It's just affected as I don't do uh, the, I don't, uh, that's a hard question because I still work and I still work a lot. <laughs> it's increased my job hours, you know, there's a, different protocols. Everyone wears a mask at in the hospital. So you guys take it for granted, but I don't know what anyone looks like sometimes because I don't know what their, what their jaw looks like, what their mouth looks like. And that really gives the identity of a person. So Corona, it sucks in a lot of ways because I can't hang out with my co-residents as much. I can't do a lot of fun things, but my job, you know, it, job is still the same, you know, take care of people as much as I can and go from there. A patient being overweight could potentially influence angles. Of, yes, that's exactly what I was just talking about. Today, I was dealing with a patient who was obese. So I had to angle it just a little bit more um, superior, you know, and it was more painful. So guys, work out, try not to be obese. A lot of, and I'm not trying to make fun of anyone who is obese or who is overweight. I'm just trying to say when it comes to these joints, weight matters, you know, the less you weigh, the better. So, and it's it's important to be healthy, you know? I'm not saying be skinny and all that. I'm not the skinniest person. I'll put my video, I'm, I'm thick, you know? That's what people say, I'm thick, you know? I'm 230, but I work out a lot. But it is important to stay healthy, you know? Uh, what do you love most about PM&R? What I love most about PM&R is the MSK medicine, the anatomy, the flexibility of work, uh, PM&R stands for plenty of money and relaxation <laughs> because there's a, a lot of good chance to make a lot of money, but working a nine to five. So it's very flexible. I can have a family. How do you feel about taking a gap year as an undergrad before med school because of the current situation with COVID right now? Do you incorporate me? Okay. Um, how do I feel about it? Like I said, I'm not, well, the whole thing with COVID, I don't think that should stop you uh, from going to med school. Uh, even if it was me, I'd say, don't try not to take a gap year. I had to take a gap year because I, you know, I didn't have a choice, but because like I stayed sharp, you know, I did my master's program and I was tutoring that helped me sharpen my tools a lot during med school. So I would say, try not to have a gap year if you, if you could avoid it. If you do, it's okay. Do you incorporate manipulations in your practice? Yes. I do osteopathic manipulations at home on my fiance as well. So I do it in my practice. I do it at home. I do it everywhere. Do pm and doctors do any kind of procedures? Yes. EMGs, as I said before, we do injections, we do fluoroscopies, we do radio ablations, especially if you're in the pain uh, field. We do um, Botox injections. We do everything. Trust me. It's so many to, to actually name. What fraternity was I in? I was in Delta Upsilon at UCF. So I don't know how they were before. We were awesome back in my day. We were great. And I'm, I, I'm very professional, but at the same time, I'm human, guys. I was in a fraternity. I did my drinking. I did all that stuff. I used to do security at pub and library. I used to do all that type of stuff. So don't worry, guys. Every You have to work hard and play hard. Um, can you go into surgery? No, we cannot go into surgery. The reason why we do PMNR is to not go into surgery. How often do you incorporate OMM? It depends on the patient. It depends on the severity of the situation. But I would say quite often, maybe once or twice uh, a day with my patients. How many years has your DO journey taken total with the undergrad and residency? So undergrad, four years. DO, four years. And residency will be four years. So four times three, <laughs> 12. 12 years in total. Minus, and then I had two gap years, so 14 years. What about the calcification that happens when using steroid injections with time? Thoughts on that? So, like I said, steroid injections are not a, a situation where, oh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's, you know, everything is fixed. It comes with side effects. The calcifications doesn't happen all the time. It happens less often. So my thoughts on that is you have to outweigh the positive and negatives. The positive is that there's a highly chance, there's a big chance that the patient is going to feel better with a slight, with the negative chances of side effects as a calcification or infection, which is less likely. So my thoughts on that is do the steroid injection if, if needed and if the patient suits the, the case. What do you enjoy and not enjoy about your specialty? What I enjoy, like I said, is the flexibility. I love the procedures. I love the different types of um, 
the diversity in my in my field. What I don't enjoy about my specialty, it's kind of hard. I love everything about um, PM&R. I don't like, I don't like spinal cord injury. I would say I haven't done it yet on my rotation specifically, but and I don't like dealing with. It's sad. It's not that I don't like dealing with it, but traumatic brain injury, very interesting, very cool. It's actually very rewarding. But to see patients that are comatose or in a vegetable state all the time because of an accident, it, it's, it can get depressing. You know, think about it. You're going out every day and something happens. You enter a car accident, your life is changed. Now you're in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. So that's the sad part, what I don't like about my job. But what I like, but what I do like about it is that we help the patients, you know, and that we help them get better. How was being a Greek life uh, while being pre-med life? It was good. I was, um, I come from a very cultured and sheltered family where my parents are very strict on me in, uh, in the house. So when I got to college, I was like, oh my God, this is a whole new world, you know? But um, I was pre-med and I knew my priorities and like, I was uh, vice president of academic chair. So I did a lot of the scholarships and the tutoring sessions. But like I said, it was a good time because I, I studied every day, but I always, always took like one day off and I always like, I went out, you know, a lot. I could have went out a little bit more, but that's the sacrifice you had, you know? And I was able to, you know, uh, talk with my fraternity brothers. They came to me a lot about any problems they had. I remember one time during uh, a UCF tailgate and we we're playing, uh, I think it was Bear Palmer's. Oh no, we we're playing darts. I don't know why we were playing darts in the middle of the field. And someone had chucked the dart, right, missed, and hit this girl straight into the medial side of her calf, straight in there. <laughs> and everyone's like freaking out. And I just remember coming over there and just yanking that thing out and putting some bandages over it. It was pretty cool. So, <laughs> but it, it was pretty cool being a pre med and being in Greek life. And, you know, it's a balance, it's a sacrifice. You can't do, go on all the, you know, the retreats and everything like that, but you make, uh, lifetime uh, friendships. My mentor, who's a pain physician, uh, he, his son was my best friend in the fraternity. So that that connection right there, he wrote my recommendation letter. He's helping me trying to get into a pain fellow. So that connection that I built in my fraternity, who's my best friend, who his father is my mentor, helped me, you know, that really, really helped me along my journey. What is your ethnic background? I am Nigerian. Nigerian descent. My parents came here in 83, 84. And uh, I've, been, uh, I've been back like two years ago. What has helped, uh, what is, has that helped you relate more to minority patients? Absolutely. It's so great when you're a minority doctor and you see a minority patient and they, they're able to tell you more things, you know, which is awesome. Do you have any recommended recommendations, advice for current college students on the pre-med track? Recommendations, I would say, is guys, live your life. Study hard, but play hard, you know? Study as much as you can, but don't kill yourself, you know? Um, a lot of, so the suicide rate is high in pre-meds and medical school. There's a certain balance to everything. Take care of yourself uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, study hard, like I said, it's so important, but it's so important to, um, to basically, uh, to work out, to do yoga. I love yoga. It's great. And to if you talk to God, if you believe in God or whatever it is you do to help you spiritually, like do that, you know, that really helps. It's a balance. Life is about a balance. And that would be my advice to current college students and pre-med um, students. Balance your life very well. Do you work on paralyzed patients? Yes. In spinal cord injury uh, field, we work on a lot of paralyzed patients. Can you talk about your nonprofit? Okay, let me talk about the nonprofit, which is the next subject, scholarship opportunity. My nonprofit is called Mentoring Minorities in Medicine. So anyone who's a pre-med who's in a minority is able to qualify for this, um, this, uh, this scholarship. The scholarship is very important to me because there's only, I think 5% of physicians identify identify themselves as black. And then maybe only maybe seven to 10% identify as Latinos and um and uh, Hispanic. And what this scholarship offers is we offer to basically, uh, the details are on my link in my bio on my, um, on my Instagram, and I'll give you guys that later. But what we do is we basically help you pay, fund for MCAT registration. We'll help you pay for a prep uh, course as well. 
and we also help pay for your 10 to 15 medical school scholarships. So it's a great opportunity. I actually presented it to UCF itself, and I think they're going to put it through the diversity campaign or the diversity organization. So all you guys, I think there's about seven, 800 people in this chat. I don't know. Guys, apply to the scholarship. Okay, it's very important when you the winners of the scholarship will also be partnered with a minority doctor who will help you mentor your career through medical school and through your whole life. You know, it's very important. We're trying to create lifelong relationships here. Okay, and um, my quote of the day would be hard work with prayer is always crowned with success. Now, when I say prayer, I don't mean that you have to be religious to be successful. What I mean by prayer. For me personally, that's what it means. It's my spiritual strength. Hard work with spiritual growth will always be crowned with success. So whatever you do spiritually to help you um, increase your, your mental health, whether that's you know praying, whether that's doing yoga, what, anything you do to increase your mental health and you also have hard work with it, you will always be crowned with success, guys. Remember that, okay? Hard work, take care of yourself physically, mentally and spiritually that's the perfect triad physically mentally and spiritually okay as you go through that journey um and then as well as oh i have something in the chat 86 86 is right now awesome all right so and then so thank you guys for attending um like i said this was awesome i hope you guys enjoyed it i hope i you know taught you guys well i hope you guys understood what i was saying I hope it was informative. If it wasn't, let me know. I can try to work on some things and I'll be back. I told uh, everyone here, especially who work for Web Shadowers, that look, I want to do this again. I want to do this as many times as possible. I love interacting with pre-med students. I love to mentor. If you guys need any contact, my re Instagram and Twitter is at rehab with Dr. O. Someone texted me the other day and said, it's, it looks like rehab with Dro. No, I am not endorsing marijuana. I'm not, it's not rehab with Dro. It is rehab with Dr. O, okay? And my email address is adedejiolusonia at gmail.com, okay? So if you guys have any questions, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, please follow along. I will answer your questions. If you guys want to create a personal relationship, um, we can talk. And I can give you further contact information and how we can get down. All right. So remember, go to the link in my bio to apply for the scholarship. It's a very great opportunity, especially for minorities trying to be medical physicians. Okay. Peace and love to you guys. Good luck with everything. I appreciate you guys for coming. You guys are awesome. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Alusanya. This was such a wonderful and interactive presentation. We all learned so much from you and loved it. Awesome. Awesome. Nice meeting you all. You guys have a we great also day. Loved your personality. <laughs> awesome <laughs> awesome i'm very like i said guys uh, being a doctor yes is you're you're supposed to be professional but i'm i'm real man like like i said i'm not gonna fake it like i'm just a, i'm a doctor now like oh no like i cuss i see all this stuff i'm inappropriate at times you have to just learn there's a balance you know you have to be professional with the with the uh the patients and then when you're with people around my age and you guys i want you guys to feel comfortable i want you guys to you know, know that being a doctor is important, but it doesn't run your life, okay? Thank you so much. Everyone make sure to check out his socials. His Instagram is Rehab with Dr. O. Awesome. Love you guys. Peace and love. Talk to you later, all right? All right. Um, the Google form has been posted in the comments, everyone, and it's in our Instagram bio as well. So please remember you need to fill it out within the next 30 minutes. Again, thank you all for attending and thank you so much, Dr. Alusanya. Have a good day, guys.